Ken, main man. So I've been looking forward to this, mate. Yeah. Um, Thank you. If I need to slow down with my Yorkshire slang, just let me know. No, what, you're all right. So what I'm going to do, Ken, right? So you reached out to me. We've hooked up. Can't wait to talk to you, mate. Just give us a two-minute introduction of where we're going to be going. Why you reached out and who you are and where you've been, as it were, mate. So uh, I did reach out to you to, uh, you know, I, I wrote a book. It, it's a book that I had in my heart and mind since my early or late 20s when I realized I had done, uh, got into a life of crime and how did I get there? I was, you know, walking down the street. I remember the day retrospecting and I realized I had taken one step over the line. There was a song back then called One Toke Over the Line and it would go one toke over the line. This, so I thought one toke took me one step. So, um, and it took me about 40, 50 years to actually get around to writing it. So now I've kind of reached out to, other crime podcast type, you know, yep. like yourself and uh, trying to get the story out. And the reason that I felt the story was so important to put in paper and to tell it is because I knew that what we as smugglers and we as drug runners went through in the early days, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, even the 90s, to where people now walk into a dispensary almost anywhere in America, 39 states have it legal, and many places, I don't know about England or Europe, but, um, and buy marijuana. And I was there in the beginning. I lost friends at an early age in plane crashes in Colombia and, you know, murdered in drug deals and people that went to jail for lifetimes for being involved. So Is I wanted to get cannabis. Is that just for cannabis? Oh, no, no, no. You know, we, I did plenty of cocaine too. So, um, which is not legal, obviously, still. But I just wanted to tell the story. It, in my vernacular of the old West, how the West was one, right? The old cowboy yep. stories of, you know, you know, the uh, crossing the prairie and the wagon trains and stuff like that. You know, that was, um, you know, that, that was a story after you guys, after, you know, obviously we kicked you guys back across the pond, but. Uh, God, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Can I just ask you, Ken? So yes. when you cross the line, yeah. Yeah. Was that a conscious decision, and did you know uh, where that might lead you, or were you just a young man, you know, carefree, hippie, peace and love, 60s and all that? You know, how, how did it come about? Well, so that's exactly right. So what happened was I was born, uh, my family were actually from Germany. We were forced to leave in a hurry uh, because of the Nazis in the late 30s, 38, 39, and settled in... Um, my, my, my part of my family had already been in America. They were living in Louisiana, New Orleans, and they had a department store there. So my grandfather came from Germany, didn't like the fact that New Orleans and the South is so humid and hot. There was no air conditioning. So he moved to New Jersey. So I grew up in this, what we call in America, this Norman Rockwell, you know, American farm life. I grew up on a farm. You know, my father didn't, we didn't work the farm, but we had a house and you know, I had hay and cow shit and horses and that lifestyle. In 1969, my father moved us to New Orleans back to where the family business was because he got transferred there in his employment. Um, that was the exact same time of free love, Woodstock, the age of Aquarius. So all of a sudden, as a 12-year-old kid, I moved from the farms of the middle America to the what I call the Sodom and Gomorrah of the Deep South, uh, you know, New Orleans. And um, my father died shortly after that. So now I'm a 13 year old kid uh, growing up in the middle of the hippie revolution. You know, I remember Layla, Eric Clapton's, you know, the yeah. first time I heard it on a record player. And this hippie chick had me come in. I was a kid, she was older. And they put it on the needle on the record player, Layla played. And then she played it again. I had to hear it twice. We were coming of age in the drug world. And sorry, I didn't want to inter interrupt you. No, no, go ahead. When your dad died, did that affect you badly? Yeah, sure. So I just moved to town. I had some friends. The, the summer of his death, I really was alone. Um, and, you know, no friends, 
my brothers weren't around. You know, my one brother went to sleepaway camp, and I guess my mother felt it was good for him. My younger brother, my older brother was dealing with his teenage life. I was just alone. And so that year when I went back to school, you know, trying to reconnect to some friends because I think my friends didn't know how to deal with the death of a, you know, and all this was young and new. Um, someone turned me on to marijuana. So I took my first, you know, marijuana. And, and of course, now I was kind of cool. You know, there was other people. I, I fit back in a little bit. And that's, um, that. you know, back then, though, you know, you smoke a little pot. Maybe you steal, a little, you, you drink a little Boone's Farm or some cheap wine. You know, you, you, you know, you're not really in the drug world. But in 1970 in New Orleans or anywhere in America, I'm sure in Europe, if you got caught with a joint, you could do a year in jail. Whether you bought it, sold it, smoked it, you know, it was a crime. So um, Jerry Rubin was a famous yippie back in the 70s. Your younger crowd won't know it. But he made a comment. He goes, as soon as you smoke your first joint, you're turned on, but you're also an enemy of society. Because remember... America and Europe too was, you know, marijuana was a villain. So I did not realize the path I was going to take. Trust me. I had no idea. I, I was just getting high. I'd buy and sell a little pot to get a little head stash when I could. But um, the big difference was in 1973, my mother moved us from New Orleans to South Florida, to Hollywood, Florida in 1973. And this was ground zero for the beginning of what I call the drug wars, right? I mean, in New Orleans, people smoked Mexican weed and they were more into like pills and, you know, it was kind of a hippie scene. But in Florida, all of a sudden it was like they had Colombian and this killer Jamaican lamb's breath and the marijuana was just better and the people understood it more and they had red buds and green, but you know, purple. And it was, so I came of age at 16. I moved to Hollywood, Florida. I, it's as if I landed in the San Francisco gold rush in 1849, you know, the whole war. And, but in the beginning in 1973, very discreet, it wasn't a big thing. Someone might bring in a couple hundred pounds they get from the Bahamas, one guy on a sailboat, you know, maybe a, it wasn't, it didn't explode till 19, a couple of years later and into the 80s when people were bringing in hundreds of thousands of pounds. And that wasn't enough to feed the desire for America, right? The drug explosion. The, remember, it takes two things to make a market, supply and demand. Yeah. And demand at that time was constantly outpacing supply. So anybody that wanted to be make a buck could get, you know, try to try to get in the drug business. But I was living. So to make it clear, geography wise, South Florida, you know, Key West, South Florida is the tip of America. It's the closest spot to South America is Colombia. So now you have the place where all the marijuana is grown and you have the closest entry point, which is South Florida. Jamaica is even closer. Columbia is about 1,500 miles. Jamaica is about 600 miles. So between those two marijuana growing areas, you know, and then right after that, cocaine followed. So that's kind of how I got in the drug business. And, and how, how was it? Was it coming in, in in these fast boats? Were they flying it in? Yeah, yeah. So funny you should say that. I've got some props with me that I can show you some of the, if you want me to pull them out, some of the things that we would do to, you know, smuggle the marijuana in. But basically what would happen is in the very beginning, somebody might throw two or 300 pounds on the front of their sailboat or hide it down below, wrap it up. And, you know, it was very casual. As it got bigger, people would bring in freighters offshore and then we would go out in cigarette, go-go boats, fast boats, or cabin cruisers like the one behind me at 54 Hatteras and load up the pot or fly it directly into Fort Lauderdale or anywhere in South Florida, you know. And then, of course, north too. But the big thing was Florida. And what were the risks? Surely, you know, like your politicians and law enforcement would know that Florida Keys literally it was the key. Oh, South Florida, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I say, in, I you know, of course, uh, I say in my book, you know, nobody was happier than the cops, the lawyers, and the politicians, right? Because this is a great thing to run on. Great way. Listen. 
drug clients have a lot of money and they're looking at a lot of time. So, but in the very beginning, it was kind of interesting. There wasn't that much. Um, in the beginning, you know, I knew people that got busted smuggling weed and they go to a couple of years of what we call club fed, you know, where you play tennis and there's no real bars. And one of my friends got busted on a ground crew on loading weed and they sent, and he was able to go to flight school <laughs> to learn to be a pilot while he was really? in prison. Yeah, I would, club fed is very, you know, that's where your lawyers, politicians, you know. Oh, the these sort of low, low, what we'd call soft prisons, low secure. Yes. In the very beginning, that's where people, that's what you did. If, if you got caught smuggling, it's a federal crime. And now, of course, if you got caught dealing, that's a state crime. You can go, but you know. And, what, and what's the difference between sort of the prison system between local and state? Well, the feds, you know, uh, back then the feds had club fed and the state do the same, but you could, some of the state prisons are pretty rough that around America, you know, there's, believe it or not, um, Amnesty International has rated them quite a few of our prisons, some of the worst in the world in treatment of their prisoners. So, you know, um, I know some guys that have done time in lots of places and America is not one of the most favorite, you know, it can, you can end up in a pretty easy place. And you yeah. can end up in a pretty tough place. You know the story. And there's jails, which I went to jail. I never went to prison. So jail is for holding areas, maybe a year, two years. Prison, you might get more time. Is that where you're on remand? What's that? Do, do you have remand in America? So while, while you're awaiting trial or whatever, we have like local jails, remand prisons. And then yeah. when you get sentenced, you go to long-term prisons. Exactly. Similar to that. Similar. And... And of course, you can be out on probation, on, uh, pr on you know, bond, which is what I would, you know, I did the two times I got busted. You, you get, you, you make a case, you put up money, you put up your house or whatever, you know, and you get out on bond and you wait your trial. You know, it, you know, it's hard to fight a case from inside the jail. So yeah. as, a, as a drug dealer, we always want to bond out. And the other trick is you always want to put as much time between you and the case. Now, there's a thing called speedy trial. Now, I'm talking to you about this because obviously you understand this stuff. Well, yeah. you, have to, you have to be tried in 160 days or 180 days. What, why is that? They just, it's a part of the law in America. You have to be, you have to have, you can't be put in jail for years waiting for trial. You have to, it is, it's a speedy trial law. But if you're smart, you waive your right to speedy trial. If you can bond out, then you, like both my drug cases, I put years between me and the actual day I had to go to trial. And were you walking you know, about until your trial then? Oh, yeah, I was, yeah, I'll tell you some stuff. I was selling Coke while I was out on a, you know, yeah, I was still working. As soon as I got out, I had to pay the lawyers, had to pay my bills. So I was working while I was out on bond, you know, <laughs> the first time. The yeah. second time, I, you know, I, I was looking at too much time and, you know, there was nothing left. The business had, you know, there was nobody, couldn't sell drugs anymore like that because I, uh, been busted and everybody knew about it, you know, it's a different thing. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of the way it started. You know, um, I, uh, I started selling drugs in high school in my mom's house, me and my brother, we would, we had our little, you know, business, you know, we grew up in retail. My father had a clothing store also. And, you know, so we kind of got the idea quick that if there was a concert or a holiday load up on some Coke and some pot out of my mom's house, you would go into my mom's house and you could go left to my brother's room or right to my room. And my mom had that 70s shag carpet and it was all worn out from all the people coming in and out to buy drugs. My is, father your mom, was, is your mom still here? No, she just passed a couple of years ago. Oh, bless me. Did, did she know about this or was this? Oh, like yeah. Oh, yeah. She knew about it. She was upset. She found four pounds of weed one time and just said she had enough. And she flushed all four pounds down the toilet. And we were just out of high school. We're still living at home. I forgot. Maybe we we're still in high school. And we said to her, Mom, why don't you just throw it away? Why'd you bother flushing it down the toilet? And then we made an offer to her. Look, Mom, you know, you're working. You know, Dad's gone. You don't have. Why don't you let us chip in and we'll give you some of the profits out of our drug business? And uh, she was, <laughs> it was, a, she was having none of that, obviously. She said, no. But um, she let us smoke weed in the house. She, she said, I'd rather you do it in the house than go out and get in trouble. And she let yeah. our friends come over and hang out as teenagers. But she had, 
they nicknamed they nicknamed our 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 house the BB and G Bears Bar and Grill, and everybody would call us up. And here's the funny thing: either our phone number back then there were things called quaaludes. You know that you need a quaalude. You know I don't know if you know what that is, but no, no, I'm not. Uh, they were, it was a pill that would make everybody want to have sex. I mean, they would just they was legal okay. pill. It was legal, but boy, you know, you know, the, it, it was uh, very promiscuous. The, maybe the ecstasy of today are different. And oh, yeah. um, the, 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 the number on the quaaludes was, they were called 0714s. Rora was the manufacturer, and the number on it was, the, you know, there's a number on a pill. Our yeah. phone number, by coincidence, by pure coincidence, was 9620714. So no matter how high you got, you can always remember to dial uh, 0714 to get some more drugs. So, you know, uh, the phone company was very kind in giving us a phone number that worked perfectly for our new business venture. Strange. Well, so, so socially at that time then was like weed and Coke, the thing, did you not, did you not yeah. go out <laughs> drinking to bars or anything like that? Was just, was it just like a party sort of lifestyle? Well, yeah, we'd go to bars cause that's where the girls were, but we'd also, have, yeah, it was, and everybody in the bars were, you know, Florida were doing coke. I've seen, you know, people doing everywhere. You know, they would just, in the in the end, you know, yeah. They, the one bar, a few of them had locking bathrooms, like a plain door. So if you yeah. go in, you could lock it. But it was big enough for three or four or five people. I remember going into uh, bars, and you know, in the end, like in the eighties, you know, and and you know, doing coke with girls in the bathroom, sniffing a line off a girl's ass, you know. And, and I don't know the girl, never met her before, you know, just all partying and getting crazy. But um, in champagne, this is when we were really rolling, you know, $6,000 yeah. nights in clubs, you know. So how, how big were you? If you've got like Mr. Big and you've got like sort of your lowest street seller, where, where were you in that sort of chain, would well, you say? So, you know, having the fact that I know some of the biggest smugglers in the world, I would never put myself in that category, right? I was just a working guy, you know, I was working every day, but um, I probably moved a couple a couple hundred, maybe a hundred tons of weed in my life and maybe a thousand pounds of Coke, you know? I mean, I know that pretty well accurate. I used to move a thousand pounds of weed at a time. So every, every time I did a move, it was usually between a thousand and, you know, if I could get two thousand according to supply and demand, you know, you, you still find, it's not like you can go to Walmart and load up your, your vehicles and load it up. And Coke, you know, I wasn't uncommon for me to do a 10 kilo deal. You know, I mean, I've been on the runway, you know, sm you know, helping smuggle in 300 kilos of cocaine. So I wouldn't say I was Mr. Big. I kind of lived in a, in a normal house and, you know, spent my money. But, you know, when you're a drug dealer, when you make a life high risk, whether you're a, a, gar, a, a cop, you know, cops have a tendency to spend their money and not do good because they're always living on the edge, right? They want to yeah. live life. They want to yeah, buy a boat in a Corvette, right? Uh, drug dealers are the same. We're spending our money. I used to go auto racing. I spend $6,000 a weekend sometimes. So I would say I was just a middle level guy in my world, right? In the world. I, but the guy next to me smuggling the largest loads of marijuana in U.S. history. So I'm right below those guys, you know. I never made hundreds of millions of dollars and had Lear jets, you know, but I've flown on a few Lear jets, you know. And, uh, you know, I can make, I'll give you an example. If I moved a 1,000 pounds of weed, I could probably make between thirty five and $40,000 a move in 1980s. Right. To put that into perspective, you could have bought a Porsche 911 twin turbo for thirty eight thousand and a house for ninety thousand. So, you know, if I said I made, ten, you know, I, I got, you know, I got robbed. Let's say I, I had 80. I move a, a load of weed. A, a, a thousand pounds of weed would cost me about two hundred and forty to two hundred and forty five thousand dollars. So a lot of times I put down a 70 or 80 or a hundred thousand dollar deposit because I had good credit and then I moved, you know, I move it and pay it. You know, I didn't have to buy it all at once. Sometimes I did, but to give an example in today's dollars, 
that's like $750,000 worth of weed, right? I mean, if I went out to California right now and bought a thousand pounds, it cost me anywhere from, um, it cost me about a million dollars or 800000 800 to $1,000 a pound. And so, how risky, how, how risky with this? If you've got that sort of money worth that sort of value, I mean, obviously growing up, I've known a few lads who were dealers and that, some from Sheffield who were travelling to Manchester and they, they were sort of dealing in, I don't know, maybe 40, 50 grand's worth. And I know a good few of them who got had over, you know, um, they're in the game happened. as it were. And then they go to Manchester and they take everything off and they take the money, the car, they, they pretty much, they'd just be left with a life and that was it. Oh, well, yeah. So, you know, it started out a bunch of cool guys. We're all high school friends. We all went to high school together, you know, and, and even the first smugglers, you know, were just guys that were just kind of hippies that found a way to make a few extra bucks. But I got armed. I got home invaded. I got armed robbed. I got tied up, put a gun back to the back of my head. Um, and, uh, and I, I kind of known they were coming. They had robbed a friend of mine. Uh, the guys, some guys that lived next door to me, and of course these stories are in depth in the book. Um, they were running around cutting people's throats and robbing them. You know, there was a whole group of, there's actually a famous, uh, documentary I came out of there's been some books written on it's called the Apollo Jim murders because all these guys were bodybuilders and one yeah. was a cop and um and, and and I was personal friends with these guys luckily I nobody I didn't know they were doing what they were doing uh luckily I didn't they never came after me or you know because they would have killed me and more likely than not but I did get robbed the, the funny thing is in my townhouse in my little house I had built so many secret compartments that uh, that even I couldn't get into one. So when they came into my house and they had done it, uh, um, I knew they were kind of coming. I have I I, I I was carrying a gun. I never carry a gun. None. I never carried a gun in a drug deal in my life. Everybody I dealt with, I knew personally. Okay. You know? And now there are a couple times. One time I ended up in Miami from a friend of a friend. I was buying a hundred. A hundred thousand pounds, uh, about a hundred pounds of weed was about a, at that time it was about eighty thousand dollars because the the prices had changed, quality had changed, and all of a sudden I'm in a warehouse with three Latin guys, Colombians, and I look at the guy, I go, "Hey, this this weed's no good. I can't buy it. It's not good enough for my market." And I don't know exactly what he said because it was broken English, but basically what he said is, "You don't have to take the weed, but the money's not leaving." And then I look up and one guy opens up a duster and there's an AK-47. And then the next guy opens up a duster and there's an M-16. And I don't know what the third guy did because I was loading the weed into my car and saying goodbye to my money. So, yeah, there's I had a lot of, I have friends, I have a friend in a wheelchair right now that was robbed in a drug deal and he's paralyzed. I have another friend that was my dear friend that fronted some Italian mobster, two kilos of cocaine in New York went up to collect his money and the guy killed him for 70 grand. Aldo, would, my friend would have given him 70 grand and walked away. You know, it's not as drug dealers getting robbed as part of your, you know, it's, it's, a big thing, yeah. it? it's a big thing over here. Yeah. Yeah. But again, we work mostly with the people that I grew up with and I knew well, but every now and then you step out of there or something happens and uh, you know, uh, we can actually I ask you, yeah. can I ask you, cause this always I, interests me. So did you, did you sort of have a normal life away from that? You know, your brother, your mum, did you like have steady girlfriends and stuff like that? Or were you full on into that business? You know? So, what, go, no, go on. Go no, so like, yeah, my brother, my brother, you know, what happened was with me and my younger brother, had, my older brother is very straight laced. He was never involved in this. My younger brother, by the time, in America, they have two things. They have, a back you used to have before you're 18, you go to juvie and juvie sucks. You'll be in a camp working on a farm, you know, you're still, you know, but you're in juvie after 18, you go to jail. So everybody figured by the time when you turn 18, we're going to go to college, quit doing this drug selling stuff and move on. You know, unfortunately, the reason the book's called one step over the line is because I took one step over that line. What I realized when I finished the book is 
everybody else took two steps back, you know, and got out of the business. I kept going along with some of my other friends. And um, so um, I had a normal life in my family, but dating girls was a little different, you know, because um, you got you got to date somebody that you, you kind of knew was cool, right? Like I remember taking my dog to the vet and the young veterinarian was cute. She's a doctor. She's a vet. She's kind of hitting on me. The girls, I'm checking out. The lady's going, you know, you know, so-and-so kind of thinks you're cute, you know, but I couldn't relate. Like, what am I going to tell the vet? Come up, come home to my house. You know, I'll tell you a story. One time I was driving down the road and we had just unloaded a boat and we had about 12, 1400 pounds in the living room. And I pick up a girl from high school hitchhiking that I had dated in high school. So I bring her back to my little house, the rental house. And my friend, Big Jeff's there. He said a lot of him and he did a lot of smuggling and things together. And he's like, what are you bringing this chick in here for? We got this weed in here. Gosh, she's a Hollywood chick. She's cool. So we went back in the bedroom and, you know, played around a little bit, hung out. And she walked in the bedroom, goes, oh, you guys got a bunch of bales here tonight, huh? She was used to it. So... I couldn't date like other people date, right? You can't step too far out of, you know, what do you explain? How do you explain to your, the girl you're dating? You're, you got a, you're an international drug smuggler or you're running dope all around the country, you know? And, um, and I didn't do that much smuggling. I didn't, I wasn't a huge fan of smuggling because there's, it's dangerous. You know, a drug runner can last 20 years. A, yeah. dr a drug smuggler usually lasts three or four years before they're, yeah. they go busted. So, but the money's so bigger. Looking back now, them early years, why did you do it? Did you do it for the buzz? Did you do it from the money? You know, did you have a lifestyle, house, cars, that sort of thing? Why Why? Why do people do it? Yeah, so it was part of our lexicon of our lives. We didn't know any better. We grew up in it. It was 1973 in South Florida. Drugs were everywhere. And, you know, and there was money in it. But I think a lot of it was in the beginning for acceptance in school. You know, you're cool. You're one of the guys, you know, you sell drugs. You, you got, you know, you got, you can party. You have a few. I, we still had jobs. I was a pizza delivery guy. My, bro, my, my brother was a dishwasher. Um, I worked as a houseman in a hotel in high school. You know, we were just making extra money selling drugs yeah. and getting high for free and kind of. But the adrenaline Later on, I think part of it was I was just used. I didn't know any. I didn't know how to make a tie. I never had a real, you know, job job. Like, you know, at 21, I didn't go work for corporate America, you know, or I, I was just a drug runner. Even when I went to college, I had had. So here's the thing. I, I had failed first grade. I had profound dyslexia. And then I remember. I got kicked out of the Cub Scouts for beating up the dead mother's son on his birthday. And then I remembered why, because he made fun of me for failing first grade. So now I have a, you have a kid that's having trouble. And I'm very smart. I just dyslexic. And then you have somebody, you lose your father at 13. So now you're guiding light, you know, and then um, we're selling drugs to have fun and, you know, be cool and make money and get high for free. And, then at 18, I met a guy named a friend of my, one of my best friends in New Orleans was very wealthy, one of the wealthiest families in the world. And his father had a small partnership going with this yacht broker. And his, his name was uh, San, Sanford Harlan Perkoff, Sandy. And Sandy looked a lot like, kind of like a Paul Newman kind of guy. Oh, kind yeah. of gray hair, good looking. Oh, great. But the old expression, pardon me for using an old expression, but he was a, uh, quite the coxman, you know, always had a young girl. Oh, very. And he met me at 18 and he, and I was already selling drugs, you know, out of my house and playing around. And he took a liking to me because I was smart and I was honest. And so he had me doing odd jobs, you know, like, and he started smelling, selling boats to smugglers and he ended up hooking up. With knowingly, one. knowingly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he ended up hooking up with one of the biggest smugglers in the world, uh, Donald Steinberg, who's I'm still friends with today. And I was a kid and they would have me do things like um, fly a Learjet with a million five to the Cayman Islands. They go, all right, hey, Kenny, you know, here's a thousand dollars. And uh, I remember one time I, 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 I started taking my girlfriend as cover 
and we dress up real nice. And then I'd go with Sandy sometimes and Sandy didn't want to go anymore. He basically trained me to do it. And the pilot, I always tell the story, the pilot looks at us and goes, care for a bottle of Dom Perignon? And we're kids. We're 18, 19, 17. So um, we say, okay. Now we've, I've drank a lot of Dom by that point. I've already been a drug dealer and, you know, part of the drug dealer mystique is Dom Perignon. And my, the gun I had was a Walther PPK because oh, James yeah. Bond, oh, James Bond right. carried it. Yeah. Yeah. I had to get the one like James Bond. Actually, on my website, there's a picture of the gun uh, that I found laying around. Um, that's the gun when I got armed robbed. They took the gun from me. They found it on me. It was in my waistband, which I normally never would do. But again, I knew that there was robbers running around. So um, anyway, back to the story about the champagne. And me and my girlfriend don't realize much, you know. We didn't realize the guy probably paid for it and was expecting us to. So the point I'm making is they could have given us root beer. They could have given us chocolate milk and cookies and we would have been just as happy. We were 18 years old, flying in a Learjet with a million five to the Cayman Islands. And I had, they picked me up in a car. I'd go through customs, the customs guy, Mr. Smith, you know, all these other commercial flights are coming in with people that are going diving and going to the beach. The Caymans is very well known for its diving and its beautiful beaches. And I go into a different room for customs, open up the suitcase, there's the money, looks at it, zips it up. That's fine. Gives it to me. Welcome to the Cayman Islands. You know, but one of, you know, welcome to the Cayman Islands, my friend. You know, one of those. And the bank, you know, takes me off. And I remember one time we go to the bank and they're going to count the money. So we're going to go to lunch. And they pull the money out of the suitcases. And I see a marijuana seed rolling around on the bottom of the suitcase. Now I'm a kid, right? And I go, that's bad because if, the Caymans really could prove that it was an illegal action that the money could be suspect. I mean, later yeah. on, the government got really down on the Caymans and the Isle of Man and all these money laundering, you know, places, the Cook yeah. Islands. But I, as the seed rolls by, I wet my finger and go like that, and I ate it. You know, it's kind of what you learn to do when you're a kid and the cops are around or whatever, but or your parents. But um, so anyway, I, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing I started doing at 18. And then I would sign all the titles for the smuggled, for the boats and planes. And they'd send me out to do the title work. And um, so what I always had you say any, is, Had you any idea, you know, oh, sort of where you were at? Because it's got to be a risky business, that. I knew exactly why they were sending me and they weren't going themselves. They were afraid to take the money. And they figured send the kid and, you know, at least uh, if he gets in trouble, keep his mouth shut. You know, you're trained. I was trained at an early age to keep your mouth shut. Don't say a word. Sandy was a professional criminal. You know, like I say, if my dad taught me how important it was to do things right, Sandy taught me how right it could be to do things wrong. How to, you know, he taught me a lot about forged documents. I turned out at a young age, I had a talent for forging titles. And so that, and then I, he also introduced me to some other smugglers. So, um, even though I didn't do a lot of smuggling, I got a few smuggling stories if I can share with you that if you think that's interesting. You, it's it's a very different life to to sort of me growing up. That um, I got asked a question the other day, so I'm going to ask you the same question. You know, if you could go back to your younger self, you know, what sort of advice would you give yourself, or would you? Would you change anything? So. Deep as breath. You, as you can bet, I've had a time or two to think this over. Yeah. I I, I don't even know. All right, so here's the thing. I, I always tell my kids that, you know, you know, jealousy, hate, regret are all wasted emotions, right? Greed yep. is actually a good emotion, just as long as you can control it. But jealousy, hate is terrible, right? Regret is the worst because you can't go back. Yeah. You can't redo things. But I'd have, if I could, I wish that I wasn't always in survival mode. After my dad died, I had little guidance. You know, I came from a good family. We had a nice house. Yep. Nobody was, you know, I wish I wouldn't have always, I've been in survival mode my whole life. I've been like, I wish I would have been more proactive instead of reactive 
And I can't regret even the loss of my father, everything that I've been through, the yep. pain, the people, you know, made me the man I am today. My ex-wife left, got hooked up on Oxycontins on pharmaceutical, not the stuff that I was selling, but in the Thank end, she left me to raise two kids at eight and 12. And I think the strengths that I learned from being a drug runner, the multitasking, the danger, the, you know, the, the, the focus helped me be a better uh, parent. And um, so we kids, wish we kids always safe. Sorry, sorry to yes. interrupt you again. Yeah, they were, yeah, my kids, my kids, the, well, I'll tell you this, what happened was, I'll, I'll tell you, go back to the facts, but so the answer to your question is, I wish I had done things differently, but I accept everything I've been through, the pain that I've caused to my family, the pain I've caused to others, the things that I've done, you know, some of the things were out of my control. You know, yeah. I've had two open heart surgeries and, you know, I had my first one, I was 39. That's life taught. I almost died. I survived that. That was out of my control. But getting into the drug business and getting busted twice was certainly, you know, you think by the. So here's what happened. Let me tell you. So the first thing that happened to me is my friend Frankie, who's from New Orleans, very wealthy. He was a child diabetic. We had we were running buddies. You know, we went to private school together. We learned to read the classics. We also learned to smoke our first joints. And Frankie got busted in New Orleans at a young age for some coke. And his father, even though he was very wealthy, decided to let the guy do a, let him dry up, let him go to club fed, let him learn, you know, play tennis, play chess, go work out. And, you know, maybe that'll straighten his son out. Not the best thing because his son was a junkie. He was a cokehead. He yeah. was shooting insulin to live and he was shooting insulin you know, his whole psychosis was the needle that was keeping him alive was the needle that was, in my mind, killing him. Anyway, Frankie gets busted, and Sandy suggests that I leave the country because Frankie implicates me. And why does he implicate me? I have nothing to do with his little cocaine bust in New Orleans. It's yeah. because I'm from Florida, and every Fed and everybody wanted the, conne the Florida connection. So, because yeah. that's where the importation area is for the country. And I leave the country. I go to Jamaica. I spent about seven months just drying out, you know, hanging out. A friend, had a, a friend of Sandy's had a hotel. And, you know, like, you know, some people, when they graduate high school or they graduate in college, they go, they go to Europe for a walkabout or they yeah, come yeah. from, you know, yeah, mine, was, yeah they, I, mine was being on the run in Jamaica from the feds, hiding out from Interpol, if, you know. And we were, out, we were worried. We were worried then. No, because I didn't think the case was going to add up to much, but it was best to be out of sight, out of mind. And and I even at that age, I'd been doing a lot of blow, so it was good to kind of get out of America and kind of chill out, smoke some good Jamaican ganja, and just relax on the beach. My girlfriend came down to visit. Other friends came to visit. And then one day, a good, my next-door neighbor, actually, this guy Bob Silverbullet, came down with another guy, Big Jeff, who was, you know, we were kind of smuggling, you know, pop, you know running buddies, and we ended up smuggling my first load of weed out. We brought 600. Bob had a, was a pilot. He had a plane he had bought, and he was also a sailor. He was a very accomplished smuggler, older than us, and he had a place to land it. He owned his own little area to land the plane. So that was my first trip, 600 pounds of Jamaican lamb's breath. We smuggled it out of um, Jamaica into for, you know South Florida. The other thing that had happened, let me clarify, is one of my best friends, my pot-dealing partner in high school in 78 was forced to go back to Ohio where he was originally from because there was a construction boom in Florida then it crashed and his family had could you know they were in construction so he moves to I tell this story he moves to Ohio and he's up there and he calls me up he's working at the Ford factory plant in Ohio and he says hey I think I can sell some marijuana up here I can move some weed I go well come on down I'll give you a couple pounds so he jumps in his car and he drives down 19 hours. I give him two pounds. He leaves. He calls me up a little bit later. A couple of, he says, hey, I can sell some more. That went fast. So I ended up getting a bale, which a bale of marijuana is like 50 pounds. Okay. It's usually wrapped in burlap It's it's and duct tape. And um, it's, uh, it's about 40 to 55 pounds, like a big suitcase. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what. I actually have a piece of a bale here. 
let me let me share it so people this is actually one of the one of the pieces the, the trips we brought out of jamaica so you'll see this is the burlap yeah so this is jamaican and then the, we put the duct tape on the outside so if you throw it out of a plane or when you're tossing it around even on the ground it doesn't split open so duct tape if you want to smuggle drugs duct tape is key back then and again this is a actual piece of a bale how, how much would it make on that on 50 pound so depending like um well, so here's the thing. If I sold that 50 pounds in America, because the market's so flooded, I mean, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I would get it for 240 to $245 a pound, whether I bought 300 or 1,000, that's kind of like the yeah. volume price. But I could only make five bucks. So if I sold 1,000 pounds, and brokered it from what, like one smuggler to one, um, we used to call the smugglers um, sharks, and then the guys that moved it, land sharks. Yeah. I was a dealer, but I was more of a drug runner. You know, I could still sell grams and ounces and pounds, but mostly I was moving product around the country. That was my primary gig to Ohio. And if I moved it to Ohio, the market was much bigger. I could make forty dollars a pound. So I would. So in in the end, I had three three cars we had bought. Each car was an old grandma car, right? It had like a big trunk like a yeah. Bonneville or Caprice Classic. We didn't use Lincolns and Cadillacs because they were too flashy, but we'd use the same car, but made by Buick, let's say, you know, big trunk. And they'd hold, the trunk would hold between three and 400 pounds. To, depending on how pressed it is in the shape, let's say about 300. Every trunk held 275, 340. And we'd have three of those, and then we'd rent cars. Sometimes we'd have two rental cars. And we put air shocks on them because if you put the weed in the back, the yeah. car is going to ride like this. Yeah. So we put a little hidden area when they pull up to the gas station, it would level the car out. And we had my friends from high school driving it. So you had a 21 or 22 year old guy or a gal driving across the country in these big, and that. How far would be, how far would they be driving? About 19 hours. It was 24 hours if you stopped. 19 what, did, what did you pay them for that? A thousand a run. Each run was a thousand dollars. So Plus that were a lot, a lot of money then. Well, nineteen seventy eight, nineteen eighty. That's uh, three to five thousand today, right? Yeah. I mean, it's five times the money. Think about it. So, you know. But by the way, you know, your drug money it goes fast. You need to, you know. So, um, uh, so I was doing that, and so I had a pretty good business going, running it up to Ohio. In the meantime, I was still doing other things. Like um, I, at one time we ran 10 kilos. So a friend of mine needed 10 kilos in Tennessee. So I helped him do that. And um, I, had a, I have a suitcase that's not, I don't have it with me, but it actually had secret compartments built into it. I bought it as a kid. I still use it today. And I, it would hold $80,000, 75 to 80,000 in $100 bills. So if I would, fl I would send the drugs up with one of the drivers, and then I'd fly up to get, you know, the money. I would get paid as it sells. So the drivers might come back with a chunk of money, and then I'd fly up and pick up a chunk. I I, I, I still fly with the suitcase, but there's no – I keep looking. I don't see any – there's no money in it. No. It's all gone. No, there's just empty holes. for the And, and, and the secret compartments, you know, they, were, they would work then. Today, you know, I, I, they certainly aren't good enough to bring something through customs or – you know, is, but they work is, locally. Are you in Florida now? I am. Is it still the place? Well, yes, it, it still is. But I mean, the whole country is the place. You know, now it's containerized shipping. It's fentanyl coming out of California. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there's cocaine. I look. You know, most of my I'm still. I, I will tell you, I'm still in the business in a sense. I have my pinky in it. So I have friends that are growers in legal states like Oregon. California, yeah. um, Colorado, there's uh, legal parts of the business. You know, I uh, I certainly don't want to commit any crimes at this point in my life. Is it, is it profitable growing it? Yeah, it can be, and it can be very, you know, if you get fungus on a, on a grow or if the grow gets, um, you know, it can, it's got to be a female plant. If a male plant gets into the female plant and it, and it, and it fertilizes it, the plants turn male and then they don't get you high. 
So I know a lot of growers that, you know, lose. It's just like, listen, someone asked me, you know, how much money I made. You know, I lost money as fast as I made it. You know, you get robbed, you know, you get a bad drug deal, you know, you know, you can lose money pretty quick and you're still spending it like a drunken sailor, you know, because you're living that lifestyle. But I think, you know, growing illegally growing it is still very profitable because, you know, you don't and, and you know, you just host, you have your black market and you sell it. But a lot of the growers are in the white market now where they're dealing through the dispensaries and it's yeah. very difficult. And then there's gray market. Gray market is where they take illegally grown marijuana that's grown unlicensed. Let's say yeah. in California, you have to have all these licenses. And you, I mean, I've been out there working with, you know, teams out there and it's just, you have to have a lawyer to, to watch the lawyer because the state's on and the taxing. So what they do is they take great illegal grown marijuana, not grown through the normal government things and sell it through the dispensaries, through the legal channels. So we got a doggy. Is that a cat or a dog? No, he's a cat. He's a sphinx cat. Bold. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, very cool. He's called very Simon. He's uh, very loving. Obviously. Well, I'm glad he's in. he's come to visit. <laughs> I locked my dogs out because they wouldn't be that easy. So, um, oh, can so, I just ask you? Yeah, so, the pharmacies, I, the pharmacies now, do you, do you need a prescription or, or can you just buy it legally? And how much so, can you buy? Yeah. So, in, in Florida, you have to have a medical marijuana card and you can get whatever the doctor prescribes, which is pretty much a lot. I mean, I have a medical marijuana card. Not that I need it. I, have, I know how to get marijuana without having to, you know, I have plenty of connections to get marijuana. But I got the card because I wanted to be legal. I don't want to have any trouble. And I yep. still go to the dispensaries occasionally and buy some weed or some stuff. In other parts of the country, it's just recreational. So there's two things in America. There's medical and recreational. Yep. And the states, it's state by state. Florida now on November 5th, with our big election, there's going to be a, a proposition on the ballot to allow recreational marijuana. So if you're over 18, yep. you can buy marijuana. And we're, that's the, listen, marijuana is not, it's, look, cocaine is a difficult drug. I don't, yep. you know, I, I, I've done a lot of coke. Um, I always say, I hope my wife never watches any of these things. Because, you know, I've done it all, man. I've shot heroin, shot coke, smoked crack, ate acid, ate peyote, must mescaline. Um, I've done speed. I've never done crank. I've done speed, but only to work, you know, uh, a couple of times when we were needed to stay up for days doing a smuggling trip. But for the most part, <clears throat> I just smoked my pot and uh, pot was made. So just so you know, in 1930s, when prohibition was coming around America, one yep. politician decided he was going to make his bones about making cannabis illegal. And there is marijuana is not a real word. And what I've read is, this politician wanted to villainize the immigrants and the Mexicans and blame because that's where the marijuana was coming from. So they, they made a word marijuana because it sounded Mexican or Spanish. But in reality is there's, and, and marijuana has been around for as long as beer, wine and tobacco, 10,000 years, 7,000 years, one of the oldest plants on earth. There's hemp, which is what we make rope out of and clothes yeah. out of. And, and then there's cannabis, which is the psychedelic portion of the plant. And there's two types of cannabis, indica and sativa. There's no real, not, marijuana is just a slang term they made up the same as pot, weed, or whatever. So what, and, what are uh, those, what, what's the difference between those two you have just said? I've never heard them words before. Which one, can, uh, sativa and indica? Yeah. So two different types of the plant. Um, actually, Theoretically, from what I've read, you know, indica is more uh, was was originally harvested or grown in a certain part of the world, I think, and and sativa. But in in today's vernacular, indica yeah. is a more uh, heavy, like puts you down, puts you to sleep type of high, and sativa is supposed to be more of an up, more of a of a of a happier high. You know, me, I like when I smoke pot, I like to feel like Joe Fraser just punched me in the head. I want to go down. I want a nice, good buzz. But, um, and listen, it's all, there's hybrids, there's sativa, indica. If you go into a dispensary or, yep. you know, or the, there's 50 different flavors and each one has a different, you know, 
terpene profile, which is part of what gets you high. Terpenes yep. are the oils, uh, you know, like strawberry is a terpene, blueberry, you know, the flavors. And then there's the THC content. So it, it's not, you know, 28 is the highest. Usually they'll say there's 30, but usually the high 20s is the THC. And that's going to depict how or decide theoretically how high you get. Okay, um, so quest, question for you. Do you think now it's legal and it's in pharmacies and that, that there's been a bigger uptake? You know, do you think more people are using it? Than yeah. They, yeah. I, I think I think people are more comfortable. I think people, I've met people that, they're you know, in their 80s and I go, so what are you doing? They go, well, we smoked pot in high school and now my wife has some medical issues. Listen, I, I need, sh I'm having my third shoulder surgery. I'm okay. 67. My knees hurt. My, you know, both, and I'm, and I smoked the pot to help me with the pain. And it really does. I mean, my doctors know on my medical, you know, board, it says I take opioids and cannabis and, you know, and it helps me sleep. It helps tremendously. I don't, I can't take these Vicodins and these opioids. I, I'm not good at taking them and I yep. can't take them all day, you know, so I smoke a little weed and kill the pain and maybe take something a little stronger at night, you know? Um, how, how have the pharmaceutical companies got a grip on that? And do they make not money? Yet. Not yet, but because I think I'm, they, I'm thinking over here, it, it's not going to be, you know, sort of on sale. I'm, I'm quite sure it'd be a good thing. I know medically a lot of people who smoke it, you know, back in the day, I've got it for friends who had various, you know, different illnesses, arthritis, ME and things. I'm, I'm just thinking that I, I can't see that ever happening in this country. I honestly can't. I, I think it will, though. I mean, it's a bullshit. There's nothing wrong with me. Nobody ever smoked a joint and beat up his wife, but many a man have had a couple of beers and gotten crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, I that's always say, way. what are you going to do, beat up your wife because the chocolate chip cookies aren't warm enough and the, and the milk isn't cold enough? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, nobody – It's it's a really harmless drug. And now, again, I talk about it, and I keep mentioning the book, but that's my reference. I'm not trying to bore your listeners with it, but no, um, no. What it, we had to know. They had to know. The, 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 the second in, in, incarnation of the drug wars was Nixon in 1970s, 3, 74, 75. And he did it because he was having trouble with his political, you know, he, he really, you know, it was documented he kind of made a big push to make drugs villainize. You know, he, he didn't think anything was wrong with marijuana, but no. he wanted to put the, the picture of the hippies in the streets uh, in the Vietnam War. You know, he wanted to put them to look like drug crazed hippies. So he tagged them. He went after marijuana. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not saying there there wasn't a problem with drugs imported into America, but how did they not know? In 1974, when they started this, this, the real drug war started to attack the, the drug industry and people doing drugs, that just 50 years earlier, prohibition left blood in the streets. You know, if it wasn't for the prohibition, the, you know, uh, illegal, making alcohol illegal in America, the, the, the Italian mafia would have never been what they are today. Vegas yeah. was built on that money. Yeah. You know, so they had to know, I say in the opening part of the book, that it was only five decades earlier that if you make something illegal that the entire population wants, A, there's going to be a black market, and with yeah. the black market, it's going to be crime, and that's going to cr create discord. What if they just had common sense laws? Like if you wanted cocaine, you, you went to a drugstore and they, you know, again, that's harder, but marijuana should have never been, it's, it's, you know. So decriminalizing in this country um quite definitely for me's future do have you heard of spice yeah it's um it's kind of like a street drug that they put right together. It is. so if you go back maybe 10 years maybe a bit more maybe 15 years yeah in this country you could buy a bag of spice various names like the cannabis various names Various yeah. properties. It was like a green plant light matter, five pound a bag, yeah. So instead of sort of decriminalizing it, they made it illegal. And it, it was a legal eye at that time. Now, spice as it is now, 
has has changed so much. It's got so many chemical. It, it's right. forty times more powerful than heroin. Super addictive. It's destroyed prisons because it's cheap and easy to smuggle in prisons. Right. You know, it, it came into the prison system and it just took over. It made the job ten times worse. Right. Uh, addiction. And and I just look look going back, you know, 10, 15 years, legal green matter, a legal high, made it illegal, and now it's somewhat far more sinister. Yeah. Well, even the cocaine. Uh, the first cocaine I used to get was very pure. I mean, it was cut, but it was pure. It was the original. I couldn't afford one, but in high school, a kilo of cocaine was $57,000 from people I knew that dealt in that level. Wow. By the time I was catching the 300 kilos on the runway in Florida, I was paying between 10 and 11,000. The Colum it was just so much coming in and the demand, but the Colombians were cutting it in Colombia or they were making it in South Florida. And the high, when the original cocaine, as an example, I'm not you know, glorifying it, but the original cocaine was really good. I mean, it was sweet. It was, it was a wonderful buzz, you know, and at the end, the cocaine was very hard. It was probably cut with speed and other chemicals, you know, and now I've lost two friends a friend of mine's son and one of my ex um, friends from the book that actually a girl I dated a little bit, but more like was my friend. She went to the gym. She's 50 something years old. Supposedly somebody gave her a joint. The joint had fentanyl in it. She went home and smoked it and died. And, you know, I mean, so, you know, and everybody says, well, fentanyl is, you know, the, you don't hear it here, maybe, but the immigrants are smuggling it in. It's, you know, the border. It's not, you know, as a smuggler, the last thing I'm going to do is give some family of walking across Guatemala some drugs to bring in. You know, that's, yeah. you, you might, but it, I'm not saying usually it's done more professionally, right? Hidden in tractor trailers, hidden in cars, you know, you know, they, they use tunnels. They go underneath the gut. They go from Mexico to America underneath tunnels. So, but fentanyl is the curse if coke, if crack cocaine was the curse of the eighties, yeah. fentanyl is the cur is the curse of two thousand and twenty four. And if the they th thing is, I know. I, I mean, I, I sort of try to follow the sort of trends. And th the thing is, with fentanyl now, they're cutting it with other things, aren't they? They're cutting it with uh, benzodiazepines and things like that, which mm. is making making it even more lethal. Right. Um, about it, but yeah, I believe you. And it's so, go on. Yeah. No, I was gonna say when I had my open heart surgery, my second yeah. one, two yeah. years ago, they give me this little button and I go, What's this? They go, Well, for pain. And they go, It's your fentanyl button. So they still use it in hospitals, legally. Yeah. You know? yeah. But um, and I kept hitting the button and she said, I said, Look, I, I need more fentanyl. She goes, That's funny. She goes, uh, when you slept through the night. You didn't hit the button, so you you, you know they, they can tell you're not waking up in pain. I go well, you know, you know, getting a little bit of a buzz, not enough to. Uh, Do you think your your heart surgery was because of your lifestyle? So um, I thought that you know because of all the blow I did in the partying, but I, it turns out that um, I had a bicuspid valve, and uh, what happened was I had an infection that got in my heart, and yeah. it destroyed my aortic valve. Now, maybe I, I could have done some blow that had some bad stuff in it. Um, but, you know, I know I, it turned out I was diagnosed very young in life with a bicuspid valve, and that's what caused it. I have good arteries. But I did ask my heart surgeon. I said, um, I remember like months after the surgery, I had my final meeting. I said, so how did my heart look? You know, when you did the surgery, he goes, well, when I had it on the bench, on the table, I'm like, Oh, great. You know, he goes, it looked good. And I'm thinking to myself, well, it should have. It ran to Chicago and back every night, never left my kitchen table. The only thing that slowed it down was a, a half a bottle of tequila and two volumes because I used to do so much blow every night, go out drinking and chasing <laughs> girls. And you know. so I'm, I'm going to ask you again, like some of the drugs you've taken, obviously heroin and the like mainlining stuff like that. Did you ever become addicted? No. So... Why not? Um, I never did that much. I did because I was kind of addicted on coke, sniffing coke. I party every night. 
you know, it, I got a little carried away with my coke habit. Uh, and that was one of the reasons I, I, I think that um, my bad dad, Sandy, had suggested I go to Jamaica for a few months just to clean out. But, um, but I, you know, when you have, listen, when you have a half a gram of coke or a gram of coke or an eight ball of coke, even a quarter ounce of coke, you have a lot of coke, but you can run out. When you have two kilos sitting in your house, which is 2,000 grams of Coke, you don't run out. So if you want to keep doing it, you'll do it until you kill yourself. And I, have in my early days, have been up for days on end partying, doing Coke, you know. But in the end, I became, I'm, I'm just not an addictive personality, you know. Everybody would be sitting around my living room at 2 in the morning doing blow. And, you know, I just look at my friends and pull the plate up and go, blow it right off the plate and go, I'm going to bed. See you later. And they'd all, oh, I go, I'm done. You know, so a lot of it was chasing girls and partying and drinking, you know. Listen, it's not unusual for people without drugs to go out at 11 o'clock at night and start drinking till four in the morning chasing yeah, girls. Yeah, true, but, true. You know what I mean? I just had a little help. But um, no, I was never, um, never like that, you know. Even today, I'm on pain medication for my shoulder and I yeah. they give me enough medication to take one pill a day and I barely do that i take a little bit i just don't want to get i'm very conservative you know i i, I just my personality but uh i'm not telling you that I, i've had problems with coke over the years but it's it was years did, did ago did you see day. your friends go by the wayside then like oh, yes. get addicted and wasted and die a lot of friends overdosed a lot of friends got hooked on crack and lost everything you know, um, a lot of friends went to, I have friends of mine that, you know, got busted. There used to be a three, th a, pro a thing here, um, three strikes and you're out. You could get three yeah. crime, yeah. 10 years. And I had good friends of mine that got three strikes for doing recreational drugs, did 10 years in jail, got out, eventually died shortly after a couple friends like that. I've had uh, many friends, many friends turn. I've seen, the, hard, the worst stories, I have actually, my phone just rang and it's a friend of mine that was so drugged up, lost everything, ended up becoming, going to rehab, becoming a drug counselor, and now runs a, a drug rehab, um, actually tra does training for him and stuff. So he turned his whole life around. Um, but yeah, I've seen a lot of crash and burns, a lot of crash and burns. A lot of people that, even people in the drug business, I have friends of mine that could have done anything with their lives. And they ended up dying in plane crashes or being murdered or being, you know, or just never finding their full potential because they can never get out of the cycle of being arrested or doing drugs. And yeah, I've seen, so, I've seen women turn into prostitutes over drugs. Good family people. So yeah. for me, right, um, if you look at our country, right, the structure. So the, there's lots of undercover cops and that who've had careers busting people. Right. And usually it's the people at the bottom. The yes. minnows who get locked up, yeah? Right. Um, exactly. And if you do get in a position where you remove Mr. Big, then the industry becomes more violent because there's three people then right. vying to take over that business. So yeah, that for me... With drug dealing or whatever supply and demand, when I look at it, I think they should be educating children. You know, uh, you've got a captive audience in school. Kids are leaving school now. I don't know whether they have it over there. So everyone's vaping now. Yeah. Which is, which is it's a Horrible. ridiculous thing. Yeah, it's a ridiculous thing for me. Uh, nitric oxide, things have changed. <laughs> we used to do that when we were kids. Exactly, but... I, by the way, you know, a friend of mine died like that. I can tell really, you. I, well, yeah. You, yeah, you, yeah, you can. But when so I look what, at it, yeah. you know, we're not educating kids. So they can make decisions or they know what they're getting into or something else. So when they had the raves over here, sort of in the 80s and 90s, maybe 90s, early noughties, they used to have tents where you could get your drugs tested, yeah? yeah. So if you bought ecstasy, you could have it tested, and they'd say, yeah, that's good stuff, no problem, or that's shite, don't take it. For me, 
that is the way certainly our country should have gone. But there's there's no education at all. It's just like you know, it, no. they're never going to stop. They're never going to stop drugs, are they? Coming into country, never no. ever. No. Well, here's the thing, like 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 marijuana, because now it's grown in America, it's not smuggled in as much because. You can grow it. Now they'll smuggle it from the West Coast of California, Oregon, Colorado, and smuggle it across America. But it, it did kill some of the smuggling when they, they just, it's just, you know, you can buy it here. You don't have to grow it in, in Colombia, but, um, or in other countries, but they still do. I mean, you still find it occasionally. But, um, we did a lot of education here. They tried a lot of that. Nancy Reagan's Just Say No program. They yeah. tried a lot. But the trouble is, I used to race cars. Right. I used to smuggle drugs. I used to run dope. I used to do all this. It's never going to happen to you is what you think. You know, yeah. how do I get in a race car? And the guy next to me gets in the race car and one of us, you know, might get their legs broken or might get killed. And the guy next to me, but it's not going to be me. So there's that thing. You know, you know, the old joke, your mother says, um, if Johnny jumps off the bridge, are you going to do it, too? What's the first, as a guy? What do you say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does he live? Does he break his legs or, you know, do I got a shot? So, you know, yeah, I'm going to jump off the bridge. So um, it's difficult. It's a difficult thing. But I think when you take the mystique out of it, when it's yeah. not a crime, then kids aren't drawn to it. If it's something that, you know, like my kids, I have four kids of two different generations. My personal children are 33 and 29. Yeah. And my current wife, my bonus boys are 19 and 20. 21. And I'm not saying that, I mean, my two kids, my older kids have never been involved in drugs. I mean, they might've tried marijuana once or done it. Something, you know, they're not, their dad, you know, just, it wasn't cool anymore. And yeah. my younger kids, they might, I don't think they smoke marijuana or if they do, it's somewhat legal. It's, you know, it's, what do you want? They're going to go drink beer or, you know, are they going to smoke a little pot? Is, but alcohol. Yeah. And they're older, 21 or 20. They're going to, right, alcohol, I think, is worse than pot. But, look, everything in moderation is, is you know, you shouldn't eat too much steak either, you know. But but it's a difficult balancing act that, you know, I don't have. I have a lot of information. I have a lot of lifetime of knowledge. I, I, I don't have the answers to that, you know, how does that work out, you know. But I know that marijuana is a harmless drug. And marijuana is is can be a gateway drug if you connect marijuana and and fentanyl and and you know uh, cocaine in the same basket then people think you know they're doing it's the same crime you go to jail yeah you know yeah. do you think if i know this is a difficult question but if you'd have been born sort of 30 years later do you think you could have been in the business of smuggling fentanyl no well you know I, I was asked that the other day and i'll be honest with you i don't like the answer so i don't know what i would i mean i wasn't into heroin i wasn't yeah. into selling drugs that were you know i didn't get into selling lsd but we really didn't do that down here yeah. because we had coke and pot and that was our you know you know L, you know uh, Hollywood, Florida, where I grew up, which is right right between Fort Lauderdale and Miami, I I call it the taint of South Florida, taint Miami, taint Fort Lauderdale. It's kind of like a sleepy little beach town, and it all was in the seventies and the eighties. Yeah, it wasn't what you see today, South Beach and all this explode. Most of that was built on drug money. A lot of the hotels and a lot of the drug, you know, there were billions of dollars in cash being pumped into this economy here. Uh, even in the worst, I mean, there was a story that the Ferrari dealer kept the guy in the dealership at night so that if you made a run in the middle of the night and picked up a quick you know buck you could go in and buy a ferrari in the middle of the night so and i know guys that would run a couple loads and then go out and buy a, a, a you know a fancy car the next day so um but honestly i'd like to think i wouldn't but I don't want to. I hope to God, I, my answer. No, no. Be yes. I, I appreciate your honesty. It is a difficult question. It is a very difficult question, isn't it? Because yeah. well, you know, so I sold. Well, let me say this: I sold a lot of coke when coke was really, really bad. But people weren't. People died from it from coke, but not too often. 
And was it bad I, from what they were cutting it with? Yeah, but even Joe, it's a bad drug. You get hooked up on it, you spend your money, you don't go to work, you know, you, you fuck up your life. But dying from it was rare, and I was doing coke, you know. So if you're doing, you know, I was doing it as much as selling it, you know, in a sense, not obviously not that much because he wasn't doing 10 kilos at a time. Yeah. But, um, and that's the right, so back to one of your questions how big a drug dealer was I? I yeah. was probably a mid-level drug dealer in my world, even though I was moving, you know, in the end probably moved, a, you know, a ton of weed is 2,000 pounds, right? Yeah. I would move a ton, it was nothing for me to sell. You know, I would do that every couple of weeks or every month, whatever I could get. As much as I could get, I would sell. And so, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to keep asking you these questions. Oh, go ahead. I'm prefer to be questioned than answer. No, no. So how many, how many people in your circle is obviously been a lot would you say have been successful dealt drugs maybe started legitimate businesses come out of that and you know had a healthy or affluent lifestyle from that not a lot <laughs> but i but the funny thing is so i remember i have one friend that uh we did a couple cocaine smuggling trips together and a bunch of other stuff. He worked for me. I, you know, he did a bunch of things. He's got busted a couple of times, got, didn't get convicted. I think he got out of the second one and has a big capable business. My other friend that I got busted with in, in Massachusetts, when we were running a, a load out of, um, out of Maine, um, that I had smuggled in from Canada, strangely enough, going the wrong way, you know, going yeah. from North to South instead of South to North. Uh, he has a big business. Um, another, you know, another friend of mine never got busted. He owns a bunch of real estate. A lot of the guys that I work with are doing okay, but they got out. And even some of the big smugglers went to jail, got out. Cause you know, a lot of the capable people were really smart. They just put their, you know, you've, you've been in jail. How many times have you, you know, as a guard, how many times have you looked at this guy going, gee, if you'd only put his mind to good instead of evil, he'd have done a lot better? Lots. Lots, S right? S sadly, a lot of people are in jail sort of in this country. Um, bad childhoods, abuse, grown up with yeah. a dad, a bank, grown up with a dad, a bank robber. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the addicts in our prisons, and there is a lot, it's they self-medicate because of the past trauma. Yeah. Uh, a lot of mental health problems in our prisons. A lot of personality disorders. Uh, grim, grim reading. If you look at the facts and figures, you know, we're all very quick to judge. However, a lot of them have just had sort of the worst childhoods ever or whatever. Um, yeah. How, how many people, I mean, you don't have to, give it an accurate figure but how many people would you think are locked up in states where cannabis is now legal for dealing cannabis or or low-end charges relating to cannabis and stuff like that so if you go to my website which is called one step over the line dot com i actually have a video where i go into detail believe it or not in two last year i think it was two hundred and fifty thousand americans were arrested for marijuana, 92% for simple possession. That's last year, uh, maybe 2023 now, or 2022, whatever the statistic is. 250,000 people arrested for cannabis and 92% for simple possession. I work for a charity, which I'm actually going to throw a plug in right now. A friend of mine, Randy Lanier, who's one of the biggest smugglers in history, also was the 1986 Indie Rookie of the Year in 1985. GTP champion. So if you have L if you're into racing, you know, uh, one of the most, you know, prominent race car drivers in the history of the sport that rise to those levels of that, of racing, you know, cause he had the drug money to put it, but he also had talent. Uh, he runs a charity called freedom grow and freedom grow. We donate time and money to families of nonviolent cannabis prisoners. There's guys in jail right now doing life 30 years. 25 years for marijuana they're still in jail because i don't know about in your country but in our country a majority of the prison system has been privatized so there's no 
incentive to let these people out. They're just a the money, you know, and, and, you know, it's just sad. I, Randy did 27 years for smuggling marijuana. He got out only because of, um, he had life with no parole. A friend of mine just that I work with in the DEA got busted um, and big, big time smuggler, but he got busted after working with me in the DEA, which is never good because they really throw the book at you the second time. But he got 22 years for smuggling a load of marijuana and he was working for the government. He was working for customs, but they, they kind of screwed him on the deal. And the customs agent turned his back on it because I guess he'd done things improperly, so he let him hang. And um, the only reason he got out was because of COVID and his age. And he was a dual citizen, so he, he moved to Spain. And when he got to Spain, he was still on paper. And the, the, the Spanish government came to him and said, we've never seen anybody that's done 22 years in jail. You didn't murder anybody. It, it was for cannabis, for marijuana, smuggling it. But so I've seen a lot of lives tossed in both directions, you know. Um, you know, luckily, someone like me, I got a second chance. Yep. I got probation on the second bust. And, you know, I went out and I, I started over and I built my life and I raised my kids. And both my kids are successful. And, um, you know, my ex-wife left me to raise the kids. And I, we don't, you know, she's out of my life and out of their lives. So that was a struggle. And uh, but I made sure that my kids didn't go down the same direction as me. You know, I made sure they were very proactive in their choices and that they, you know, they weren't in survival mode. And uh, here's a look, here's a statistic going back to what you were saying. Yep. 20 to 25 percent of the population is dyslexic. Right. 50 percent of the population in the prison is, has dyslexia. Yep. So um, ADHD, you know, 50 percent of the prison population, I think. 25 or 50 percent is also ADHD. You know, I, I had a cellmate. You know, he was on medication. He had five personalities or three. He's a big guy. He's an ex-basketball player. I remember one time he looks at me and he goes, "You want to play hangman?" And he's sitting in my bunk and we're in his underwear next to me. And I'm like, "Hangman?" <laughs> and, 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 and he's drawing. You know, it's like a little kids' game. I go, and he kept using my toothbrush. And he had no money. He's an inner city black kid. He's got no money, you know. They don't have commissary, you know. You have to buy your own toothpaste, your own canteen, toothbrush. prison canteen, yeah, exactly. And uh, I'm buying, you know, candy. I'm sharing with him because he has nothing, and he's my celly. You know, either you always take care of your celly, right? So, um, he says to me one day, he goes, um, "I have three personalities." This is why we're playing hangman. I go, really. Because he kept using my toothbrush, and I kept telling him, John, yours is the yellow one. Mine's the green one. And he goes, uh, yeah. I go, well, what are your personalities, John? He goes, well, there's little John. And I go, oh, so he's childlike. He's playing. That's what he's doing now, right? And I go, uh, what's the other one? He goes, uh, good, John. I go, oh, what's the third one, John? He goes, bad John. <laughs> like, oh, bad John. Hey, you want to play? <laughs> I'm like, great. And it turned out he was on all these drugs that they had kept him on. And then he was trading the drugs to other prisoners, which aren't going to get anybody high. They're Thorazine. They're, you know, yeah. and I'm like, hey, hey, no, the, guard, the guards kind of, huh? He, he'd be very unstable if he was selling his drugs. Right. Um, I apologize. I don't know why the phone keeps ringing. I thought I shut it off. No, no. Um, but yeah, so I'm like, the guards knew about it. I go, I told one of the guards, Bill, I go, hey, you know, he goes, yeah, we know. You know, you know, make sure he swallows it. I don't want to be locked in the cell when he comes off his medication. But uh, um, so yeah, there's a lot of people that, you know, we don't have in America, we don't have mental health facilities anymore. First off, you know, we don't have um, socialized medicine. So, you know, they do have a thing called Obamacare, which does, uh, but, you know, people say, well, these people need help. Well, you gotta, they got to see doctors before they can get medical, mental help, yeah. right? We don't have a system. So what their system is, put them in jail. And there's a lot of people, you know, you're, ta you're talking, you're, you're touching base on one of my, you know, big points. Mate, mate, listen, people. mate, you, you don't have to tell me. Right. You know, I've seen people in absolute crisis. You know, they've been arrested because they're acting crazy or something like that. They'll come to prison. Then they're waiting for a hospital place, which is a... An, an absolute nightmare. Yeah, uh, in itself. You know, they should be building mental hospitals, not more prisons. 
Right. But, but, but they're not going to do that. All they look at, we're keeping the public safe because we're keeping people locked up. That's all right. they do. And sooner or later, you got to let them out. And now they have no, they, they, they're, they're less prepared than they went in. Exactly. They're more institutionalized. They're more, and you know, in America, I talk about it in, again, I bring up the book, but in, in the book about black and brown incarceration. When I was handcuffed to a couple young black crack dealers, you know, and here I am, one of the biggest smug, you know, you know, biggest criminals in that case, in that courtroom that day, I had a better chance of getting out of jail than they did. And I did. Why? Because I had money, connections, and I knew how to beat this, to work in the system, you know? Ken, uh, yeah. I'm going to have to go. Listen, that might be a good place to stop that courtroom. I absolutely know um, the stuff that you want to talk about that I've got so many questions about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so do you, do you mind if we hold it there? We're talking about the courtrooms. We're talking about you getting caught. And that would be a good place to start next time. Yeah. I, you know.